Welcome to RBC's Markets in Motion podcast, recorded March 28, 2023. I'm Lori Calvacina, Head of U.S. Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Please listen to the end of this podcast for important disclaimers. Today in the podcast, we've got updated thoughts on sectors, sentiment, and small caps. Three big things you need to know. First, S&P 500 tech sector valuations do seem to have room to run, while EPS and revenue revisions have turned slightly positive, all of which supports are continued overweight on the sector. Second, the body of our sentiment work continues to suggest fear has been approaching potential peak-like levels, but falls short of providing U.S. equity investors with an all-clear signal. Third, other things that jump out from our high-frequency indicators include how economic and earnings forecasts continue to anticipate a 2024 recovery, the return of high-quality leadership, and how small-cap performance relative to large-cap has hit an important crossroads. If you'd like to hear more, here's another five minutes. While you're waiting, a quick reminder that you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple and Spotify. Now the details. Takeaway number one, S&P 500 tech sector valuations do have room to run on our model, while earnings and revenue revisions have turned slightly positive for the sector, all of which supports our continued overweight stance. We've refreshed our sector models for the new GIGS classification changes and taken our valuation model back to the late 90s. Previously, we started looking in 04. Tech is now in the middle of the pack versus other sectors, slightly above its long-term average on a relative forward PE, but not egregious. Something that's been jumping out to people in our conversations is that it's consumer discretionary that actually looks most expensive right now within the S&P 500. That's not a stat distorted by any one company, as our data set is based on unweighted medians. But it is worth noting that consumer discretionary looks undervalued within small cap. Putting valuations aside and getting back to tech, What we notice on our revisions work is that tech and industrials are the only two sectors with positive revisions on both revenue and earnings forecasts right now. That's a big change for technology, which was deep in negative revision territory most of last year. Moving on to takeaway number two, the body of our sentiment work continues to suggest fear has been approaching potential peak levels, but falls a little short of providing U.S. equity investors with an all-clear signal. Things that make the stock market look most interesting from a contrarian perspective right now. AAII net bullishness has been at minus 28%. Below minus 10% is typically a buy signal with a 15% forward return on average on a 12-month basis for the S&P 500. Additionally, earlier this month, the equity put call ratio also returned to the highs of 2010, 2011, 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020. Below last year's all-time high, but still at a level typically followed by strong S&P 500 returns on a 12-month forward basis. Additionally, the weekly percent change in money market fund assets, which has been on par with December 2018, October 2014, August 2011, and August 2007 levels, makes us think that it's possible fear has been overdone. We're also watching CFTC data on Russell 2000 futures. This indicator returned to slight net short territory earlier this month, but still has some room to travel before hitting last year's all-time low. And obviously, we're watching the performance of the banks closely, the problem industry of today. The KBW Bank Index is trying to stabilize after returning to its late 2020 lows relative to the NASDAQ 100. We're keeping a close eye on problem industries because we think it matters a lot in this kind of environment. We took a look back at stock market performance in 2008 around the Bear and Lehman failures and found that while the broader stock market and tech stocks chopped around after Bear, banks were weaker, warning of the problems to come. By contrast, growth stocks, which were the epicenter of the tech bubble as represented by the NASDAQ 100, actually stabilized after the WorldCom bankruptcy, which helped the lengthening bottoming process in the broader market begin. Wrapping up with takeaway number three. Other things that jump out from our high-frequency indicators include how economic and earnings forecasts continue to anticipate a 2024 recovery, the return of high-quality leadership, and how small-cap performance relative to large-cap has been at important crossroads. While it's possible Wall Street simply hasn't updated its models yet, we find it striking that economic forecasts in particular are not reflecting an uptick in recession expectations for the U.S. at this point, and still expect to see the negative GDP environment to be relatively contained in 2023. We think the ongoing idea of 2024 being a recovery year is helping the stock market to stay resilient, since a 2023 recession was essentially already priced into the S&P 500 at the October 2022 low. 
Additionally, the return of the high quality trade in the Russell 1000, as well as the Russell 2000, is something that may be providing some comfort to investors, as that kind of environment in which high quality works tends to be a good one for active managers from a performance perspective. And on small caps, the chart that's really burned into our brain at the moment is that Russell 2000 performance relative to the S&P returned to May 2022's low point on Friday. Small caps had a nice move on Monday, and that bounce back makes sense to us given that the Russell 2000 PE has been around 13 times. Historically, the Russell 2000 index bottoms out in the 11 to 13 times range. And while we may be wrong on this as long as the money flow is flowing into big cap tech, we're longer term investors by nature, and so we're sticking with our small cap overweight, since in our opinion, the index is no longer baking in that anticipated 2024 recovery, as was the case to start the year. That's all for now. Thanks for listening, and be sure to reach out to your RBC representative with any questions. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.